All right. Looks like uh, we've got quite a few folks joining today. Um, we're going to go on ahead and get started. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time today. We're really excited to share the uh, the drive tool with with everybody, and um, looking forward to being able to provide this uh, this this excellent analysis um, opportunity to our uh, partner cities. Um, so we'll go ahead and kick it off. Uh, my name is Jared Walker. I am an EV fleet specialist for the Electrification Coalition. A um, little background on the EC. We're a national nonprofit organization, and we are dedicated to reducing barriers to electrification for all fleets. And uh, primarily, we're really focused on a lot of municipal fleet electrification, but we've got a huge uh, number of projects that we're working on that address concerns over uh, medium, uh, heavy duty, and then also, of course, light duty fleet electrification for all sectors. Um, it's a little, we'll, we'll hop into a little bit of background on the drive tool and uh, we'll, we'll go through kind of a, a run of show. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the drive tool and then uh, we'll, we'll hand it off to our, our guest, uh, Rebecca from Pittsburgh. And then Matt uh, will be able to kind of delve into a lot of the specifics about the functionality, functionality of the tool and um, some of the results that it can provide and how it can really assist with a city that's looking to either start electrifying or uh, continue their electrification efforts within their fleet. So one of the key uh, barriers that we've been able to identify over the last several years that we've been uh, helping cities with electrification efforts is the ability to take a snapshot of what your fleet looks like and then find the sort of near-term, mid-term and long-term electrification opportunities that are most suited for uh, light duty, medium duty and heavy duty vehicles. A lot of this is going to be dependent on what's available in the marketplace and what really makes sense from a cost perspective. And then also, of course, um, what, is, what is going to be a practical solution for, uh, for a lot of municipal fleets. And so there are a couple of ways that we can do this. One that is a great method is telematics. Um, it's a, a device you'll be able to uh, plug into your, your vehicle's uh, OBD port, and it'll track everything from daily use patterns to how much fuel is consumed or uh, electricity and then um, help to identify if, if that would make sense for uh, an electric vehicle uh, to, to fill that place. One of the challenges with, with the telematics though is a lot of times it's very costly and analysis takes a long time. Um, at, at, the at the minimum, we're looking at you know, maybe uh, several weeks to up to several months and it can be really difficult also to interpret some of those results. A lot of times there's so much data that comes in it's hard to know exactly how to, how to look at the data, sort it and manage all of that. So it seemed like a great opportunity for us to be able to assist our cities looking to do electrification um, by providing, with, providing them with an easier to use uh, opportunity to upload data into our software. And then we can run the analysis and then cross-reference that data with uh, existing models, daily use patterns, and really help to, to drill down into what really makes the most sense, again, in the near-term, mid-term, and then long-term electrification efforts to help achieve a city, uh, city's goals. Um, so again, these near-term procurement opportunities are really helpful as a, a great way to kind of get into electrification, or then again, also to expand out on uh, fleet's efforts to electrify their fleet. And so a lot of times uh, what we're trying to really hone in on are looking at those average lifetime and per mile costs by models. So comparing what it would cost to operate for a specific amount of time, a traditional gas uh, ice vehicle, uh, comparing that against an electric vehicle. And one of the, the great uh, aspects that we're able to look at with the drive tool is when, when do we achieve cost parity? So we can also look at what these comparisons are and then also frame it in a number of months or years, uh, depending on daily use patterns and the specific vehicles that we're comparing. Um, we're also able to provide emissions comparisons. And so we're through our tool, we're able to give real, real world examples using um, the, the energy generation mix of specific zip codes and we can provide all of this analysis in a, a nice, easy to, easy to understand, easy to read, and then also, very importantly, easy to present 
uh, graph and screenshot of, of exactly what we can achieve by electrifying specific vehicle models. And then, of course, overlaying that over a period of months and years to, uh, to help us really zero in on when we can achieve those goals. Um, some of the, the data points, how we're, we're referencing and cross-checking all of this information. And one of the things that makes our uh, drive tools so powerful is the ability to have this up-to-date information. There's a lot of great calculators out there online. Um, a lot of them uh, oftentimes will be um, not, not always up to date. And um, so we really wanna be able to provide the most accurate information as possible and looking at it as a snapshot of what can we do today. And so the information that we're pulling to assess the, to assess the, the various uh, fleet inputs are from uh, FHWA, so Federal Highway uh, Administration, DOE, EPA, and then also fueleconomy.gov. And that is great information because again, it's very up to date and that feeds directly into the tool. So we're, we're actually able to project out even a full model year in advance of, of what is even available to purchase right now um, from a vehicle perspective. Um, so we're able to upload all of that information and it makes it really nice too because the, the data can be updated into an Excel format and you can just download that. It, it runs all of the calculations right on your computer. So you'll have access to all of that. You can export all of those files. And really it can be as basic input as just a VIN number. We're able to just take a list of VINs, what's in your fleet currently, for instance, and then bump that against uh, what are the uh, standard um, standard cost for those vehicles, uh, MPG, all of those factors. Um, of course, the more information that's uploaded into the tool, the more accurate our results will be. So annual mileage, uh, life expectancy in the fleet is encouraged, um, but again, it is optional and we can use just simply that, that spreadsheet of VIN data, which is very easy. Um, so again, it'll just run right on your computer so it doesn't require um, you know, logging into uh, uh, downloading a whole a whole other uh, software platform or anything like that. We, as long as you've got Excel, you can use the tool. And um, we're constantly updating the tool. Um, I know Matt's been working very hard to make sure that the user experience is is as easy as possible. And then also we've got some great new features that are out there, so we can do this automated report downloading. Um, we can also layer on uh, charging infrastructure, what those costs would look like to really give you a very accurate snapshot of exactly uh, what, what financial impacts it would have in the near term. And then looking out uh, to uh, broader electrification efforts as the fleet continues in, to electrify and we get more models that are available. So there's a lot of flexibility in there as well. We can look at leasing, we can look at different financing options. Um, and then we can also include incentives and rebates in there as well, specific to um, your location that would give us an even more accurate snapshot of the cost implications. Um, here's just a, a little snapshot of what, it, what the results could look like and, and, and will look like once you run the analysis. So we can use various uh, model selections. So you can actually just upload exactly what models it is that you're interested in looking at. If there are some that you're not interested in looking at, we can take those out. So we can really uh, specialize it and customize it to, to give you an accurate uh, picture of, of what would be possible within your fleet and then taking into consideration any constraints uh, that, that you might be concerned about uh, including. So we can sort all of this information. We can make all some great recommendations using very, uh, this very accurate data from, from the, the various sources we're pulling from. And then again, XB, being able to export all of that data and then provide it in a, a, in a nice presentable format uh, can be a great, a great help. And so with that, thank you very much for uh, uh, tuning in. And I'd like to hand it over to our colleague, Rebecca Kiernan with the city of Pittsburgh to talk about her experience so far with using the tool and um, some of the benefits and, and how really analyzing a fleet and looking at that long-term electrification effort can really help with setting goals and understanding how, uh, how to achieve those goals in the near term. So thank you so much, Rebecca. Thanks, Jared. Hi, everyone. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about what Pittsburgh's um, uh, fleet and transportation emissions goals are. 
um, and, and how, how and why we're really excited about this Atlas tool as being a, a way to help us. If we could go to the next slide. And oh, we could skip this one. Um, so uh, I work in the Office of Sustainability and Resilience at the city of Pittsburgh. Um, so, uh, you know, just a little bit about our goals and where they come from. Um, we have a climate action plan that we released a couple of years ago. It was our third version. Um, and we set a series of really lofty uh, 2030 goals um, for the climate. So um, one of them is 100% fossil fuel free fleet by 2030, um, which the Atlas tool obviously is, is a, a big part of helping us with. Um, we also have in the public sphere, uh, transportation emissions reduction of 50% 50, 50%, that's citywide. Um, and then also um, just to keep us grounded, we wanna make sure that, you know, when we are transitioning our fleet um, over to electric, um, we also wanna make sure that we are sourcing 100% renewable energy um, for our facilities. So that's, you know, for buildings, but also for our fleet charging. Um, and then you can kind of see the breakdown of uh, transportation emissions in Pittsburgh um, for carbon um, are about 17% of our entire portfolio. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, and, and in Pittsburgh, we have very poor air quality. So a lot of our transportation emissions um, or emissions reduction targets are also aligned with improving the region's air quality. Um, uh, and, and what this map shows, this is a really interesting mapping project that came out of Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and you can see those, those dark red areas mostly align with um, where we have major thoroughfares. Um, so transportation emissions is, is, a, is a really big factor um, along with industrial pollution that kind of settles, but um, transportation emissions is a big factor in, um, in Pittsburgh's poor air quality. Um, we don't meet attainment um, consistently for uh, EPA air quality attainment for nitrous oxides, um, or for PM 2.5 for particulate matter. Um, so it's really important to us to make sure that, you know, not, not only are we reducing emissions of the tailpipe, but we're also reducing the amount of um, emissions that are, that are coming, blowing in from regional uh, energy, ener dirty energy production. Um, so that's super important to us. So we can go to the next one. Um, and basically, so, uh, you know, we've just gotten our Atlas analysis, which is super exciting. Um, we had done some modeling in the past, emissions modeling, um, uh, you know, f through our climate action planning process. Um, but basically what this is showing is a super basic, um, you know, uh, replica of what an electric car emissions reduction would look like. Um, we're really excited and, and, you know, I assume that we're going to, we're going to see what, how the tool looks. Um, but we're really excited to also be able to model out, uh, based on our fleet vehicles, um, the emissions reductions that we could achieve um, for, you know, both for carbon, but also for nitrous oxides and PM 2.5, where we have those um, attainment issues. Um, so that's a, that's a really exciting uh, facet of the tool that we're, that we're excited to use. Um, you could go to the next one. Um, and then just a little bit on our fleet transition strategy and, and why, obviously, you know, it talks a lot about the air quality emissions, but we're also interested in the avoided O&M of our vehicles, um, you know, fuel savings, monetary savings. Um, we're also looking in, you know, we're looking at it a little bit more holistically. So making sure that we're um, right sizing the fleet, uh, you know, make uh, tr uh, switching transportation alternatives for employees. Um, downsizing our vehicles and then also like smart routing, especially for, you know, refuse pickup. Um, and then, you know, fleet turnover obviously is really important. Um, so, you know, those are all, all things that we uh, found in the Atlas analysis um, and that we can better explain uh, going forward. Um, you can go to the next one. <clears throat> Um, and then this is a, from 2014, we did a baseline fleet emissions analysis. Um, so we, we have been modeling our fleet in the past. Um, basically, we were able to see what it is that our fleet is producing in terms of emissions and consuming in terms of fuel. Um, but where, where our, our new fleet analysis uh, takes us is, is what uh, emissions reductions the, the fleet will be able to achieve. Um, so in terms of greenhouse gas, nitrous oxides, PM 2.5, um, and then, you know, the, the fuel use consumption, um, those are all things that, that we're now able to 
um, look at, you know, and target those specific vehicles um, for those reductions and then see where the monetary savings might be, especially thinking in terms of, um, you know, if, if, you know, coming down the pike, there might be um, some stimulus funding, you know, where could we target um, those initial dollars so that we are seeing those, those savings and those benefits um, up front so that we can then pump it back into the fleet um, over time to, to hit those uh, more expensive and, and tougher to convert vehicles. Um, next one. And then this is a little bit about our, our fleet makeup. Uh, so we have 1200 total vehicles. Um, we also operate cool things like horses and fireboats. Um, but uh, so far what, what we have been able to convert, we have 10 uh, compressed natural gas refuse packers. Our use case is really difficult uh, for an electric conversion. Um, so we're trying to prioritize, um, you know, CNG isn't great, but we will be able to switch that over to renewable natural gas. Um, but, uh, you know, having, having the Atlas tool kind of show us, um, you know, the, the savings that we could achieve with electric makes, makes a better case for a switch in, in, you know, our use case so that we maybe would be able to, um, uh, you know, operate electric vehicles. Um, we also currently have 26 EV sedans. Um, which we're seeing seeing some payback on. And then um, we also have 32 police hybrid sedans right now, um, but are also now able to show what it would look like if we were to switch to uh, an all electric model. Um, you can go to the next one. And then a little bit about <clears throat> um, our charging infrastructure. Um, so, so far we have uh, five of these freestanding solar powered, um, non-grid tied, uh, level twos, um, which you can see we held a concert underneath, which was super fun. You can also hold concerts uh, at your EV chargers. Um, we have uh, nine grid tied level twos. Um, we're just about to break ground and, and complete a project that will install another 30 plugs, um, which is going to at the same parking lot with the solar chargers, which will now become our uh, main fleet depot for electric charging. Um, and then last week we just uh, installed a, our first DC fast charger at the city's garage, um, which looks really sweet. It, it glows up orange at night. Um, and then uh, also in the public sphere, um, we have uh, 35 level two chargers. Um, we are just completing a strategic plan that, that looks at all public property um, for uh, between the city and also its parking authority um, and where to prioritize those public chargers. Um, you can go to the next one. And then, um, so this is that parking lot, that fleet depot that I mentioned. Um, so we will finally be installing um, those grid tied level two chargers that we were looking for, um, but we kind of have a, a larger master plan behind it. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that we're trying to couple everything um, that we do to switch over to electric um, to also make sure that we have a renewable energy source that's associated with it. Um, so the city uh, is currently procuring 100% renewable energy through credits, um, but we are um, looking to make sure that that generation is happening locally. So it's locally offsetting um, that poor air quality that we're experiencing in Pittsburgh. Um, so we have this big sea of parking at our second Avenue, now EV charging fleet depot. Um, and we're looking to install about 1.2 megawatts of solar energy in the coming years. Um, so it's a, a super exciting project. Um, it's along the corridor that we are dubbing Electric Avenue, um, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, and then you can go to the next one, which I think is the last one. Um, and how we're organized, um, a couple of years ago, we convened an EV task force, which in included internal and external stakeholders um, and some residents who helped us uh, come up with some uh, priorities for our fleet and for public charging. Um, we've now uh, 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 convened for about the past year um, an internal delivery unit um, with the help of Electrification Coalition and some other partners that we have through the American Cities Climate Challenge. Um, and now we're, we're starting to see the benefits of this interdepartmental team, which has um, really been uh, delivering on our infrastructure projects. Um, but now, you know, through this, this exciting uh, Atlas tool can, can get a lot more targeted about um, which vehicles we want to prioritize for conversion. Um, it also relieves a lot of pressure on trying to figure out which vehicles are out there. Um, so we have more of an idea of, you know, what the technology is that exists. Um, and then also um, just being able to understand what that, that monetary savings is too. 
um, it really helps us make a, a much better case, um, you know, especially during budget season. Um, so that's a little bit about Pittsburgh and how we're planning to use the Atlas tool. Um, we're really, we're really excited and thankful to be one of the pilot cities um, and to use it further. So thanks. That's great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting to see all of this uh, great stuff that's going on in Pittsburgh. And um, yeah, congratulations. I mean, really making so much uh, headway there. It's really exciting to see. And thanks for, uh, for giving us that snapshot. Um, at, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Matt, to go through a little bit more in-depth um, demonstration of how the tool works and, um, and, and the sort of various inputs that are, that are required. Yeah, thanks for that, Jared, and definitely excited to be sharing with you guys here. We're doing a little bit of a, a wizardry, techno wizardry handoff here. So let me jump into a screen share. So um, as, as has been alluded to between uh, uh, Jared and, and Rebecca, um, and we're really excited to have the city of Pittsburgh on. We've actually been piloting the drive tool for about, about going on a year, actually, since we really did our first initial concept with it, uh, with our uh, partner, Atlas Policy, who's our who's our partner in crime on developing the tool. Um, overall, look to pilot it with a number of American Cities Climate Challenge uh, participant cities, which is a funded program through Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, which also provides funding for the tool. But using city input, that's where how we've really gotten to where we are today. So we're really grateful to see Pittsburgh and, and a couple other pilot cities we worked with as well to really help us um, uh, uh, confirm some hypotheticals we had around how cities need to use it, also add in whole new features. So uh, it's really great, but let me jump into the screen share. Uh, so I'm gonna just kind of take us soup to nuts uh, through the whole process here. As you can see, this is Cedar Point, my hometown in Sandusky, Ohio. Nice, nice uh, background on a, on a cold, cold, rainy day like it is today. So um, the drive tool itself, it does run as a macro enabled Excel tool. So when you download it, it will download as an Excel file. So let's go ahead and crack that open. I'll probably open on my other screen here. And as that opens, um, one, one immediate feedback, you'll see the, the uh, Excel file opening here. Um, one feedback we do get from folks is, hey, I just downloaded the tool and I'm trying to run it and it's not opening. Um, you do need to be sure you have macros enabled on your Excel uh, program or even uh, sometimes on files, there'll be an enable content option at the top of the Excel file. Be sure that's selected. And if you're running on a locked down computer, such as a computer that might have specific security protocols or something like that, um, double check with your IT. Feel free to reach out to us as well. We've been helping folks work through that, but definitely um, be sure you have macros enabled. So with the tool open, you'll see it doesn't really look a lot like an Excel sheet and that's on purpose. We really wanna make this a, a very straightforward easy to go through process, essentially designed for those that might be a little bit afraid of a large Excel file when they're working with that. But um, I'll hit new fleet because we're going to be starting with some new fleet data. You can also save your work and come back to it later. Uh, so doing that, you would basically save it as its own processing file and then open that up as the um, processed fleet data as well. So I want to emphasize too, you don't need to do this all in one fell swoop. You can save it, come back to it. So clicking on new fleet, uh, I'm gonna open up our fleet data. And again, we can really work with a wide array of fleet data, uh, CSV, Excel file formats, the biggest thing that you just need to be sure of, and we'll circulate demo data just to help capture that. You just need to be sure that you have titled columns. So in this case, uh, we're gonna be looking at the vehicle identification number, which is the VIN number that's uh, uniquely assigned to each vehicle that runs off of a production line. Um, we can also take in the vehicle miles traveled and the uh, expected useful life. Those aren't required, but we are going to integrate that too. If there is one required input, like Jared said, it is that VIN number because we use that to ultimately track the year make model of the vehicle and then use that in our, our charting of the vehicle. So I'll hit open, go to my desktop, and hit demo data. So it's just populating in here. I have to go through a couple of fields here just to be sure it's looking at the right thing. So for inventory worksheet, I'm gonna point it to the demo data tab. Every Excel file you work in has a tab, even if it's just the one tab. So we know we want that tab. 
For VIN serial number, uh, again, we have the titled column, so I'm going to tell to look at VIN. Expected years of life, I have a useful life tab that I'll point it to as well. And then for annual vehicle miles traveled or VMT, I'll use the annual VMT option. If you don't have that, we do have a default VMT, which is 12,000 miles a year, which is about on average what we see of the typical uh, vehicle that's operating fleet. Again, this is something that's optional, but we also have a default that you can use there too. With all this uh, just charted out, I'm going to hit next. And what's going to happen is it's, uh, the program is going to take the data and it's actually going to compare it against the uh, publicly available VIN decoder, which we use to decode the VINs and then ultimately assign that out. So you see it's just ticking away here. I was doing some test runs on this. It should go through sometimes uh, in the middle of the day. The server can run a little slow on that side. Yeah, it's running a little slow. So actually, let me, I'm going to exit out of this I, in the pre-bake kind of moment whenever you're watching the baking segment. I do have the, the data pre-processed here. So let me, let me actually exit out and I'll bring that in really quick. But um, with that, it, it might take a little bit of time if you're trying to run through a lot of, uh, a lot of different types of data. Um, overall, it'll, it'll be just using a general internet connection, but in case you're trying to run a lot and it seems like it's taking a while, it's just talking back with the tools up there. But in this case, I actually am gonna use our pre-saved option. I went ahead and ran, ran that calculation. So I'm just gonna open that up as saved work. So we're gonna load that in. And as you see, it charted out all the different vehicle types that were in the data set. We have light, medium, and heavy duty. So from Toyota Camrys and Chevy Malibus, all the way up to some international dump trucks and, and big um, operating things. One question we did receive in the Q&A is, um, uh, uh, can you chart smaller vehicles against pickup trucks. So for instance, if you're trying to think about downsizing a pickup truck application, is that allowable and is that eligible? And the answer is yes. This is actually where you would do that. So let's say with this Dodge Grand Caravan, we actually want to take a look rather than the Chrysler Pacifica hybrid that we have it queued up to, we could take a look at uh, smaller vehicle options such as the Chevy Bolt. So if I were to go to Chevrolet and go to Bolt, that's a way I could, I could Cue that up so it's going to take a look at that type of chart selection. Um, this, these inputs also is where you can be able to toy with different uh, pricing scenarios, especially if you're looking at incorporating incentives or grant financing. Um, so this is where you would be able to incorporate those different pricing scenarios. I'll show a little bit later how we can also take a look at some different leasing scenarios. But if you want to do any specific uh, tinkering with the vehicle assignments, this is where you can do that, that type of moment. So with that all up there, I'm going to go ahead and hit next um, to help us dial into the specific emission settings, as well as general pricing of electricity and gasoline, which we ultimately pull from EIA data, uh, which is indexed to the state level. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and type in my local zip code, which is 43026. And then as a next step as well, this is where we can also add in some custom scenarios. So this is when you're taking a look at different ways they could be operating your fleet, purchasing your fleet, or other considerations that you might want to be incorporating in there. So I'll hit add custom settings just to show you a couple different settings that we can uh, tinker with and add into this. So to start on the market conditions, um, this is a simple setting where you can add different pricing scenarios for gasoline, diesel, electric. Um, you can even add in cost of carbon if that's something that you're wanting to consider in your in your general operating and general cost, as well as on route charging. This is something we heard back from fleets where they might actually have to use some public charging on on route and wanting to add that into the pricing consideration. So these are all places you can add that. Um, as you do that, you just add that as a custom value and then add that into the um, the general pricing scenario. Essentially, the more scenarios you add, the slightly more, uh, the slightly longer rather it takes to calculate and crunch those numbers. Um, so bear in mind, as you do add in those custom scenarios, it might take a little longer on the back half to calculate that out. Um, essentially, it's just rerunning each vehicle with all those comparisons. Um, another setting too is on charging strategy. 
So this is again a consideration of how you might be using your charging mix. So um, for instance, let's go ahead and take a look at that. At the start, the tool assumes that you're going to do 100% of your charging back at a main domicile, such as a fleet depot or just a main home base. But with this, you can actually dial it in to use a certain percentage of public charging or even a certain percent of on route charging as well. So, this is another way you can toy with that, especially if you're trying to look at different scenarios where you might not do all of your charging back at the home front. To quickly go to the procurement strategy, this is actually a section we've really focused on building out and developing further um, as we have gotten a lot of requests back for considerations of beyond just straight cash purchases, which is a traditional way, especially public fleets procure, but adding in some different considerations for um, leasing strategies. I won't go into each one, but um, overall, we're able to account for different tax incentives, um, other different considerations, as well as the um, ownership strategy. With ownership strategy, you're able to either consider it as a straight cash purchase, or if you're trying to take a look at either a purchase loan option, or even some open or close-ended leasing scenarios, these are different ways that you can add that in. Um, if you have no idea any of the words that I just said, that's okay. You don't have to fill in, in these categories. We really added this as a request for it those users that are maybe a little more advanced on their procurement strategies and trying to crunch numbers in different ways, um, such as uh, uh, looking at a closed-ended versus an open-ended lease. So if I open up a, let's say a track open-ended lease scenario, these are a bunch of different ways that I can add in uh, uh, those different considerations and procurement options. Um, another thing too, and those of you who have gotten to work with the EC through our EV Purchasing Collaborative Program, you might be familiar with the term of monetizing the tax, the federal EV tax credit. And that's just the simple notion that while a public fleet is not able to claim the federal tax credit in an outright purchase, just due to the simple fact that uh, uh, public entities don't file federal taxes, by working with a third party private financer, such as a dealer, that's a way that you can be able to have them monetize the tax credit on the vehicle purchase and pass some of the savings through to you. So this is where you can be able to toy with some of those settings. Um, we also will be integrating this tool into our broader climate mayor um, and EV purchasing collaborative work as well. So expect to see it as you're talking with us in the future too. We'll, we will be continuing to use the tool in those settings as well. Um, I do also see one question in terms of how to incorporate maintenance costs. I realize I, I, I moved on in, in the slide, or sorry, in the, um, in the vehicle tracking, but actually back to the vehicle tracking, that's where you can customize the maintenance costs as well as some of those other specific costs as well. So you are able to control that, especially um, we do pull from a generalized data set on that uh, in terms of it, it is based off of previous work we've done. But if you have a specific maintenance cost that you do track in your fleet shop, that's a place where you can put that in as well. And I see a lot of questions dropping in. I'm trying to weave them in as we go here, at least be sure we cover those topics, but do please uh, please keep dropping in the Q&A and we'll be able to answer those too um, on the other side. But uh, just to keep us moving along, I'll go ahead and run the analysis, which does have some of those different strategies and scenarios that we've added in. So if I hit run, um, we have this set up to just give you a general time estimator. Uh, the caveat here is if you have a very high powered computer, it will be able to calculate and crunch through that a little quicker than a regular laptop. Um, for reference, I am actually running this on a regular laptop as well. Um, but it takes anywhere from a couple of minutes to, to 30, 40 minutes if you're, if you're running a larger fleet. Um, as I'm doing a screen share, it might also be uh, running a little slower there since we're taxing the computer a little bit. But as you can see, it charted out all the scenarios. Again, if you add a lot of those different scenarios, um, it might just take a little bit longer to run. Worst case scenario, we've seen it run anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour, especially if you're looking at a lot of different procurement options. But by and large, we really did design it to be able to run on very uh, nominal computer hardware, not require a super computer <laughs> to run. So um, with that run, I'll hit view analysis results. And this is where that'll take us to a populated, um, it'll, it'll take a little bit to just render that out. But this is where it'll take us to some general 
uh, dashboard results, as Jared covered, where we're able to look at some of the different graphic interpretations, as well as an automated report, and also just general data output, aka just table data that you can, you can drop in there. But as we're waiting for that, let's see, are there any, and Jared and uh, actually Sarah, I'll de defer to you if there's any questions coming up that would be, that, we, that might be good to answer. Yeah, there's one you were starting to hit on it, but I'm not sure you've covered it all the way, Matt. Does the tool include service and maintenance of EVs? Yes, yes, we do cover that and that, that is runnable um, in the tool. And also emphasis here too, is you can rerun the results as well. So, um, you know, while I have created one scenario here, I can go back to that save file, go back in, delete scenarios, add new scenarios and be able to rerun it. That's um, something we really want to be sure we were able to cover. I also see one question on, can you limit ice replacement vehicles to BEV only battery electric vehicles or PHEV only? And yes is the short answer. Back to that vehicle mapping, that is the specific spot where you can um, purposely track vehicles to only only one vehicle type if you want. So you could track it only to um, all electric or plug-in hybrid. By default, we actually have, um, and, and what, we, what we really want to focus on is there's an automatic, um, automatic tracking that happens. So it will automatically, whichever is the best direct swap, but that is also, uh, Uh, that's where you can also lock that into. I, on medium and heavy duty side, we're working with OEMs to bring in more and more of their vehicle options. We have a pretty good sampling here, especially of what is popular in the market. But as there are a lot of new OEMs entering the market pretty quickly, we're being sure to work with them as well to be sure we can get all of their vehicle options created, especially once they have MSRPs and are pretty close to um, launching their product. We want to be sure we can incorporate that as well. I'll let me focus on the. Uh, let me focus back on the on the spreadsheet here. So as you can see, we have an automated uh, we have an automated uh, report coming out here. So this is our general dashboard results. Um, let me zoom in. Actually, I I did see one request of if we could zoom in. Unfortunately, we have that window as you're processing through fixed. So I do apologize for that. But I'll zoom in here so that we can see a good result in return. Um, so at the top, we really focus on nominal cost per mile per vehicle use case. This is a generalized return across uh, light, medium, and heavy duty segments that went in. Um, so this is just across each and every vehicle segment, what's the generalized aspect that we saw. So in this way, you can sort that through on the charging costs, cost of carbon, financing, insurance, and so forth. You will notice, and this is definitely something we get asked a lot, is the depreciation value. It is something that you can ultimately remove if, you, if you're not wanting to consider depreciation of the asset and the vehicles. Um, typically, we do actually see cities and fleets need to consider depreciation, especially if they're looking at a resell option. That, that ultimately is something that they do try to calculate into the return. But if you do intend to drive the vehicle uh, all the way to you know, the end of life, be it you're going to use it in a primary application and maybe move it to a secondary use uh, later on in life, that's something you can also ultimately remove if that's not gonna be a factor or consideration if, if you're not looking at those resale options. So scroll down, um, we also have some, uh, you know, again, focusing on some generalized fleet returns, uh, different ways we can break down the data. So in this case, uh, you know, we have the fleet vehicles by use case, we also have TCO for EVs by electric cost scenarios. So that's again, just general ways that we focus on breaking down um, some quick quick play-by-play -play graphs and charts, especially charts that you could just simply copy and paste into emails, memos, reports that you might be generating internally. I'll call your guys' attention though to the percent savings for EV by vehicle type. So this, this graph right here, it ultimately indexes to different makes and models, especially those that have the biggest cost returns. So it's a very dynamic chart, depending on the vehicles that you're running through the analysis, it will change the specific recommended vehicles. Um, we also really do focus on running the vehicle scenarios to the most cost-effective option first and foremost. Going back to that question of, can I index it to like a very specific vehicle type or specific drivetrain? Absolutely. 
but we also recognize a lot of users, they're really going to be focused on what's the closest T, uh, total cost of ownership or just general cost savings I can get. So uh, in general, calling it attention there. And then at the end too, for likely EVs to have a TCO, uh, again, just focusing on a generalized overview, because of a couple of the cost scenarios that we did actually add in, it looks like our medium duty trucks uh, and, and vans we were running through aren't at a cost parity moment, but a lot of our passenger and light duty vehicles are. And that's something I really wanna underscore here too, is we, we are really focused with the tool uh, to have it be a really helpful snapshot in the moment. How are you currently operating your fleet? And where does the total cost of ownership lie? Uh, we do enjoy, and, and we really are glad to get to work with a lot of fleets uh, on that 100% electrification scenario. How can we get your fleet fully electrified? And so we really wanna use this tool to identify what's the short-term opportunity. Where can we focus our attention first because as we do have new vehicle models coming out and new, uh, you know, new, new battery pricing and, and vehicle pricing across a wider, wider array, the intent is that we're able to rerun this, this tool as scenarios progress to then identify what's the next batch of electrification. So I, that is something that folks have asked is why is there, you know, why are you showing that there's some here that aren't, aren't a fit? And it is a, by intent of showing how, how there might be some specific vehicle segments in your fleet, whereas others maybe aren't the immediate priority in terms of total cost of ownership. I'll talk over to the report setting. So um, again, this was actually a big request is just a general ability to focus on a downloadable report. So you can see there's a nice big save as PDF button, which allows us to download the report as a full, full PDF. You can also just simply copy uh, different charts or text out of this as well but focuses on just that general overview of TCO analysis. Um, imagine this is something that you would either put on a fleet manager's desk or someone that you're trying to quickly brief on, on fleet electrification potential within the fleet. That's where we're really focusing on this. It will dynamically update based on the fleet, but overall wanted to focus on having a quick briefing material that restates a lot of the previous graphs and just creates a general, um, a, a quick turnaround opportunity to be able to run and analyze the fleet. All right, I'll turn video back on. Um, I know this is a lot of information that we're, we're definitely divulging here. Um, and you know, as a next step as well, we are absolutely happy to, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to do dedicated walkthroughs of the tool. The tool has been online now for going on, um, going on about, our third week, and we've, we've, we've been really excited to see the high usage throughput. Over 250 users have downloaded it already. But with that, um, and I'll jump out of the screen share for, the, for a moment, we can jump in if Q&A is needed. But with that, um, we have definitely got a lot of questions from users, just being sure they're using the tool correctly. Um, please do reach out as you guys are using it, as we do intend to continue rolling out uh, iterative updates. We're on version 1.2 of the tool, and we do have general features planned out to version 1.5, and we're looking even beyond that with our, our partner in Atlas policy. But as you have questions, questions, considerations, do flag it back with us as we're actively updating the user guide, being sure we can play out those scenarios. But um, I think I advanced enough to get some new questions coming in. So uh, let's see, one I do see from James is the tool defaults to cash purchase, but allows you to just look at financing and lease options. Does it have an option to indicate that the current vehicles being replaced are on a lease or rental contract, not owned? That's a really good question. Yes is the short answer. And actually I'll follow up with you, James, offline as there's a specific way that you would just need to code that in. Um, that is a good question though on, on how to integrate that. We, we are really focused on continuing to build out that leasing scenario option as especially a lot of public fleets are looking at leasing vehicles in some cases for the very first time. So we recognize that's a very new territory, especially when you're looking at vehicle procurement, but um, we'll follow up with you offline on how you can also code that in just to be sure you're getting pointed in the right direction. Um, I'll throw it back to Jared and Sarah. Any other big questions coming up in the chat that, that we haven't been able to answer as we've been going along? Yeah, this is great, Matt. Thanks so much for delving into all the details. Obviously, it's a super powerful tool. 
and a great way to really understand what makes sense, um, you know, for, for our fleet to transition and, um, you know, kind of understand all of the components that go into it as well. I, you know, I love having that, uh, the, the financial aspect in there of, um, you know, the flexibility to look at, can we include uh, financing options and, and um, leasing and, you know, including those incentives. One of the things just kind of um, practically speaking, there was a question about integrating the tool with uh, an existing fleet management software. And I did answer it in the chat, but it might be good just to kind of touch on that, the simplicity of uh, being able to just use really just a list of VINs. Yeah, and, and this is definitely the going, it's the, the meta, just the very fundamental methodology that we really want to base ourselves around is we do reckon like telematics are a phenomenal solution for, for a lot of fleets, especially when you want to look at that detailed granular capture, you're able to capture you know, data down to the millisecond level. And we did design the tool to both be able to integrate data coming off of telematics, but also did design it with the intent of fleets that don't have any telematics at all. And you know, the we're thinking of the very small public fleet that only barely has a sense of tracking on their fleet, but we still want to be able to offer at least a place to start as we're looking at the telematic or sorry, the analysis of where EVs can be a fit. So overall, that's why we did focus on designing it where we can take in a wide array of Excel sheets. So if you are using like Geotab or other popular telematics platforms, um, if you download that data set as Excel sheet, we're able to take it in. Again, the, the central tracker that we're really looking for is that, that VIN, the vehicle identification number, um, as well as the useful life and vehicle miles traveled if you have it. Um, but with that, the vehicle identification number is the, the secret sauce as it were that allows us to track that. Um, but we have been able to connect with a number of fleet users that do have very, very uh, advanced telematics approaches, which are which are equally great. If anything, think of this as a way to use that that gut check uh, moment on where EVs can be a fit in the fleet. Often we do get to work with public and private fleets that maybe are sixty percent of the way there. They're pretty sure a Chevy Bolt or a Nissan Leaf or even larger medium duty options would be a good fit in the fleet. They're just looking for a, a quick way that they can vet that and, and just get a general analysis set. So that's that's where we really focused our time and efforts on developing the tool. Um, and actually with that too, one, one question coming through from Greg is <laughs> with the flood of announcements of new EVs, isn't that true? Available in 2022 to 25, especially on the delivery van and, and medium duty option, does the current version of the drive tool or future version plan to incorporate future purchases when these new vehicles become available? And the short answer is yes. And, and that's another aspect that we really want to design in the tool is the light duty vehicles. Uh, so the light duty segment, we're actually automating that data from fueleconomy.gov and a couple other uh, Department of Energy resources. So that is able to automatically update as new vehicle segments come available. Um, we partly did that on purpose because of that big flood of data, we would have to be coding uh, into, in, into infinite, infinite time in order to capture all that. So we really wanted to be sure that the tool can automatically integrate vehicles as they do come available. For medium and heavy duty, there isn't a, a fuel economy.gov equivalent. So we do actually have to manually code that in for the time being. We're trying to work on a couple scenarios to help make that an automatic process as well. But um, with future versions of the tool and, and with the current version of the tool, new, new light duty vehicles are automatically integrated. And we're really focused in turn to, to be sure we're capturing the medium and heavy duty options as they come out. Gratefully, we have a lot of close relationships with OEMs and vendors, and they're really excited to see the tool as well. So, um, so we're definitely making the rounds to be sure we capture all vehicle data as it comes out, especially on the medium and heavy duty fronts. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, you know, and also I think we're uh, adding some availability of some of the the, the retrofits and, and the upfits in the meantime as well as more of those medium and heavy duty vehicles come on. So that's really exciting. Um, one of the things we definitely want to address, there's been a lot of questions about how do we how do we access the tool? Where do we go to download the tool? And um, just wanted to address that as well. Yeah, we have that right on the website. So it's uh, electrificationcoalition.org slash drive drive without the eye. Um, we'll, we will circulate that out, uh, both uh, recording of the webinar slides and then also the link back to the website uh, to all registrants. So even those that weren't able to attend will get it. And on the website, we, we have that as a continuing, uh, we're continuing to add elements to that. 
One big request we did receive from folks is the ability to have demo data sets. So we will share the data set that I used today, um, for instance, on that, um, as well as we do have like a user guide, some other support documents to help you along the way, as well as uh, my own contact information. So don't hesitate to reach out as you're using it or run into any issues or have any feedback. We gladly solicit it, especially as we just want to make it bigger and better. Um, one question too that we actually had actually to Rebecca, I'll, I'll call you back to the forefront here, is funding. Um, basically, if you have any thoughts or feedback on how cities can be their own Pittsburgh and what's the general strategy Pittsburgh used? Uh, I, I know I, I get to work with you on that weekly, but any thoughts on funding strategies for, for when you're trying to tackle charging and flea electrification and everything else We've um, been really good at hustling state grants. Um, and then Pittsburgh is also, you know, I talked, I like belabored the air quality issues, um, but that also op opens up other grant opportunities with the EPA for us. Um, so, I mean, what we've done so far, um, being, being budget strapped, probably like most other cities, um, we've been able to uh, do the replacements, um, you know, as they come up for replacement, that's really been our main strategy so far. So we haven't really gotten, gotten a chance to like get ahead um, of those vehicles until they're at the end of their useful life, life um, with the exception of, you know, whenever a grant opportunity does arise. Um, I think a lot of the states um, also through some of that VW settlement money um, are offering grant programs. So, you know, I would recommend just making sure that you're um, tapping all your, your potential grant sources. Um, but that's been our strategy so far. Also, um, you know, the potential for any stimulus money, um, we're trying to make sure that we can prepare um, what we want to, what we might want to use that for in terms of fleet, um, just in the event that, you know, that stimulus money does come down. I realized I was on mute. Um, if you need help also like hunting down those grant funds, the good news is there's some really good online resources there. Also, feel while we're really focused on the, the uh, drive tool here, uh, the EC is also here to support uh, support everyone on the EV purchasing collaborative front. So we're absolutely happy to give you a quick read in on any available incentives that might be available, especially VW settlement funding in your in your state. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out on on that front too. Um, one question as well, and, and yeah, we're entering the last five minutes here, so do be sure to get in any remaining questions. Um, does the tool factor in lev zev standards and what vehicles might be limited to certain markets? That's a really good question. The short answer is no. We do actually just populate this across fueleconomy.gov vehicles and which, which those which most closely track. However, I will qualify my statement with by and large, we have, we're not seeing, um, or rather, I'll be careful on, on like the qualifier because it's always conditionals. We are actually seeing a lot of those previous ZEV only vehicles like the Hyundai Kona, the Kia Miro, um, and, and so, so forth. They are actually starting to go nationally available. Um, that being said, if you are running into a moment of, and, and this is just true in general of, um, let's say you are limited on the vehicle options that you're trying to run because you only can use a state bid contract, for instance, or something to that effect. Again, that's where you can go back to the vehicle mapping and be sure it's going to index to a specific one. Again, I will remind you of the EV Purchasing Collaborative with our partner Sourcewell. We do actually have some contracts that can be that can give you access to vehicles outside your own immediate market, and that's just a helpful way to still consider all your vehicle options. Um, so in general, that you know, again, feel free to reach out if you feel like you're limited on your vehicle options. We can help you with thinking through uh, different procurement strategies and actually vehicles that might not be on lot at, at a local dealer, for instance, or something to that effect. Um, another one coming through: thoughts on end of life decommissioning, disposal, reuse, landfill, etc. So that would be both for the vehicle and for the battery. The good news is um, on the battery front. Dealers will take that back. There is there is inherent scrap value in the battery, both in terms of um, the battery itself actually does have secondary use, typically, especially utilities. We're seeing a lot of popular secondary use as a distributed energy resource um, and, and just general grid improvement. So uh, there is inherent value. You, you will be able to find someone 
most likely taking that back. Dealers especially are really focused on um, in, in intercepting batteries and vehicles as they come back. Uh, the, the vehicle body itself definitely has inherent use uh, and value too, both for, if you're looking at a scrappage scenario, there's definitely value in that. But also um, as we do work with a lot of fleets, more are looking at just selling back. So, so back to the depreciation question, just selling, selling the vehicles back at auction, for instance, is often a popular choice we see with fleets. Also, a number of folks uh, were asking for the direct link. Again, dropped it in there to electrificationcoalition.org slash drive for, for that. And again, we'll share that out with, with the gang. Awesome. Well, we hope overall this has been informative. We do recognize there's a lot packed in here. Um, you know, we're really excited to be able to bring just deep level analytics, ultimately deep, deep level analytics that you can do in a matter of minutes, um, thinking of it as just fleet analysis for the masses. We recognize that, um, you know, telematics and there's a lot of other great analysis tools out there, which, which we definitely recommend using, especially if you're wanting to go very in the weeds on your tracking. But we really want to also focus on just creating an easy to use tool as a place to start for a lot of fleets. So, um, you know, by and large, we definitely encourage folks to download it, check it out. We will also, as you do uh, download it, we will be keeping a listserv of that. So as new versions of the tool come out, we'll be sure to notify everyone, let you know what the latest feature additions are. But um, overall, just definitely excited to have the tool out there as a new way we can help others um, just accelerate electrification of their fleet and find the best fit in the immediate, uh, the next round procurement, as it were. But with that, I guess we can go ahead and call it a close, but thank you, Rebecca, for joining. Um, thanks, Jared, for giving us the overview walkthrough. And we'll be in touch with everyone with slides, recording, and, and uh, the download link to, to the tool. But definitely excited to, to show this off and, and share it with everyone. So thank you, everybody. Hope everyone has a good day. Thank you. Special thank you to uh, Rebecca Kiernan from the city of Pittsburgh as well. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a great day.